got a, a lot to discuss today, so I'm going to ask you to do your best to stay focused. This is uh, not unlike learning your multiplication tables. At times it seems a little tedious while you're doing it, but the re reality is if you have any hope of being able to progress and deal with the broader and deeper issues, you're going to have to pass through this and gain understanding. Now we've been studying Leviticus chapter 6 and we ended up last week addressing the question of whether or not holiness can be transferred by simple contact. And perhaps the better question is not so much can it be transferred but will the Lord allow it to be? And as to whether it can be transferred theoretically, by contact, the answer is probably yes, with some limitations. As to whether the Lord will allow that to happen in most or in all cases is something else. The answer is probably no. It seems that a person or a thing must be declared holy in order to come into contact with something else that's holy something that's not been declared holy but contacts something that is holy is usually destroyed. And I maintain that this is because of the danger that something that was not authorized by God to be holy could accidentally attain it. But the Lord simply won't allow this to happen. So carefully guarded his holiness as the most precious commodity in existence. So I find myself persuaded by Baruch Levine's argument that the meaning that we talked about last time, uh, is be, this being communicated in Leviticus chapter 6 verse 11, one we need to tuck away as a general God principle, is that only an authorized person who is already in a state of holiness is permitted to touch that which is holy. So let's continue in Leviticus chapter 6 starting with verse 13. Um, we'll probably start at verse, actually verse um, 12 I think and continue on. And by the way this is going to be different in each Bible. The verse numbering is actually uh, a little bit different so this will be possibly, depending on the Bible you're using, verse 19. Okay. Adonai said to Moshe, This is the offering for Adonai that Aaron and his sons are to offer on the day he is anointed. Two quarts of fine flour, half of it in the morning, half of it in the evening, as a grain offering from then on. It is to be well mixed with olive oil and fried on a griddle, then bring it in, break it in pieces, and offer the grain offering as a fragrant aroma for Adonai. The appointed Kohen, appointed priest, who will take Aaron's place from among his descendants will offer it. It is a perpetual obligation. It must be entirely made to go up in smoke for Adonai. Every grain offering of the priest is to be entirely made to go up in smoke. It's not to be eaten. Adonai said to Moses, tell Aaron and his sons, this is the law for the sin offering. The sin offering is to be slaughtered before Adonai in the place where the burnt offering is slaughtered. It is especially holy. The Kohen who offers it for sin is to eat it. It is to be eaten in a holy place in the courtyard of the tent of the meeting. Whoever, whatever touches its flesh will become holy. If any of its blood splashes on any item of clothing, you are to wash it in a holy place. The clay pot in which it is cooked must be broken. If it is cooked in a bronze pot, it must be scoured and rinsed in water. Any male from a family of Kohanim, from priests, may eat the sin offering. It is especially holy. But no sin offering which has had any of its blood brought into the tent of meeting to make atonement in the holy place is to be eaten. It's to be burned up completely. Now, it says that what follows is about an offering, or in Hebrew, korban, korban, that the priests are to present. And as I explained in earlier lessons, 
only priests can present the sacrifices and only the priestly family from among the, Levi, uh, among the Levites comes from Aaron and his sons and their descendants. Now this verse is often misunderstood. It seems to indicate that there are regular occasions on which priests are anointed with oil and that the ritual that starts in verse 13 is performed on those occasions. That's not the case. Remember, when these words of Leviticus were first being spoken, it was early on in the exodus from Egypt. And these are but continuing instructions for the construction of the wilderness tabernacle and the rites and the rituals and the laws and commands that are going to operate within the, the, the tabernacle. In other words, what we're reading in chapter 6 was spoken before the tabernacle was even built. Before Aaron and his sons were even consecrated as Jehovah's priests. So what is simply being communicated here is that beginning on the day that Aaron and his sons are officially consecrated as priests, the ritual instructions for the tabernacle are then to take effect. Now, these instructions begin by designating a standard amount of flour, semolina it's called, that is to be used for the mecha sacrifice, and that's a tenth of an ephah, which is about two quarts. Now remember that this particular mecha offering is the priest's offering. It accompanies the twice daily olah offering. As the olah involved a ram in the morning and a second one in the evening, so half of this quart of semolina is sacrificed in the morning, the other half in the evening. Now, whereas some of the minka offerings of the regular worshipers could be eaten, none of the minka offering offered by the priests can be eaten. It all had to be consumed by the fire of the brazen altar. The general rule of thumb is that if it is a priest's offering, meaning laymen were no, in no way involved, that the entire offering has to be consumed by the fire. If it's an offering brought by a layman, even though it's, of course, always a priest who, 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 who puts the offering from the layman onto the altar, then usually a majority of that portion can be eaten. Now we've discussed before that there were a number of acceptable ways in which the flour could be prepared. However, for the priest's mincha offering, only one way was acceptable. It had to be cooked on a griddle and the dough had to be well soaked, it says. In other words, a sufficient amount of liquid, chief among which was olive oil, had to be used so that the mixture was on the wet side as opposed to the dry side. Those of you who do a little bit of baking know what I mean. Now let's not overlook in verse 14 this constantly repeated thing. A pleasing odor to the Lord. It is that purpose of burning up things on the altar that is used to create smoke and the purpose of the smoke is to create a pleasant odor for God. Now for those of us who might not have been here in the later parts of Exodus and the early parts of Leviticus, it might be a little unsettling to read here in the Old Testament that the process of burning things up on the altar is to create smoke. But there's little getting around it. Okay. We just have to remember that while God had spiritual reasons for this, that the Israelites couldn't quite grasp as of yet. The Hebrew mindset of that day thought of a burnt offering within the typical Middle Eastern cultural mindset. And it was a common understanding that gods were simply superhumans who had eyes and ears and feet and arms and noses. And that they resided up in the sky. And so smoke would float up to where they lived. And they'd inhale it. Another recurring theme presented in verse 15 is one which we touched on earlier. Those grains and animals and wine designated for sacrifice belong to God. It is the Lord's. In effect, this is the definition of the term holy property. 
It's anything that has been designated for, given to, belongs to him. Holy property. And what we find as a general rule in this section of chapter 6 is that the priests may not personally benefit from the korban, the offerings. That is, they may not partake in offerings that have been made by the priesthood as opposed to the layman. They can only benefit from the korban offered by the general population, the worshipers in general. Now starting in verse 17, we move from the ritual of the mecha to the ritual of the hata'at, which I have decided is better to refer to as the purification offering rather than the usual translation of sin offering, which I think is, is misleading. Notice that the Ola is a blood sacrifice. Then the Mincha is a sacrifice of plant life. And now the Hata'at, we're going back to a blood sacrifice again. Let's briefly discuss a few details to begin with. Just as the animal for the Ola is to be slaughtered on the north side of the altar, so is the Hata'at animal. And next we see that the priests are to eat of this sacrificial animal under the same rules as the standard Hata'at offering. That is because verses 17 through 22 are discussing the priest's role in the service of the Hata'at when it's bought, brought rather by a lay worshiper, a common man. But then it changes. In verse 23, it switches to discussing what must occur on special Hata'at sacrifices that are brought on behalf of the priesthood or the congregation of Israel as a whole. And verse 20, 23 defines those special sacrifices as times when the blood from the sacrifice is brought into the sanctuary for use to be sprinkled around inside the, the holy place or, or on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, it's used inside the Holy of Holies. So to be clear, when a common man, a non-priest, brings his hot dot sacrifice to a priest for the priest to supervise the ritual, then, the, then part of the animal is burned up. The other part set aside for the priest as food. But since the meat from the animal that is offered on behalf of the priest is considered Kodesh Kodeshim, most holy food, then only the priest can eat it. And they can even only partake of it inside the courtyard of the tabernacle. In addition, any blood from the animal that spatters onto any of the priestly garments must be removed by washing the garments in water. If any of the meat from the sacrifice is prepared in a clay cooking pot, then the pot has to be destroyed because it was perfectly understood that a clay pot was porous. It would absorb some of the, the meat broth that was cooked in it. If the priest portion of sacrificial meat was cooked in a metal pot, then, because it's not porous, it could just be washed. That was sufficient. And the priest's family could not use this meat since only males could participate. Now I remind you of this statement we see once again in verse 20, which is usually translated as anything that touches its flesh shall become holy. And I suggested that this is an incorrect translation. And it ought to read anything that is permitted to touch its flesh must be in a holy state. And again, the issue is, does holy food transfer its holiness to the people and to the garments and to the cook pots? Or is it that each of the items and the priests themselves must already be in a holy state in order to touch that holy food? And I say it's the latter. Now in verse 23, things change a little. Because this is no longer about a sacrifice being brought by a common man. It's about a sacrifice being presented by the priests, either on behalf of themselves or on the nation, uh, behalf of the a, a nation of Israel as a whole. In this case, the entire 
sacrificial animal has to be burned up. Not the priest, not non-priest, nobody can eat any part of that animal. Let's move on to Leviticus chapter 7. Leviticus chapter 7. This is the law for the guilt offering. It is especially holy. They are to slaughter the guilt offering in the place where they slaughter the burnt offering, and its blood is to be splashed against all sides of the altar. He is to offer all of its fat, the fat tail, the fat covering the inner organs, the two kidneys, the fat on them near the flanks, the covering of the liver, which he will remove with the kidneys. The Kohen will make them go up in smoke on the altar as an offering made by fire to Adonai. It is a guilt offering. Every male from a family of Kohanim may eat it. It is to be eaten in a holy place. It is especially holy. The guilt offering is like the sin offering. The same law governs them. It will belong to the priests who use it to make atonement. The Kohen who offers somebody, uh, someone's burnt offering will possess the hide of the burnt offering which he has offered. Every grain offering baked in the oven, cooked in a pot, fried on a griddle, will belong to the priest who, co- who offers it. But every grain offering which is mixed with olive oil or is dry will belong to all the sons of Aaron equally. This is the law for sacrificing peace offerings offered to Adonai. If a person offers it for giving thanks, he is to offer it with the thanksgiving sacrifice of unleavened cakes mixed with olive oil, matzah spread with olive oil, and cakes made of fine flour mixed with olive oil and fried. With cakes of leavened bread, he is to present his offering together with the sacrifice of his peace offerings for giving thanks. And from each kind of offering, he is to present one as a gift for Adonai. It will belong to the priest who splashes the blood of the peace offerings against the altar. The meat of the sacrifice of his peace offerings for giving thanks is to be eaten on the day of his offering. He's not to leave any of it until morning. But if the sacrifice connected with his offering is for a vow, or it's a voluntary offering, then while it is to be eaten on the day he offers his sacrifice, what remains of it may be eaten the next day. However, what remains of the meat on the sacrifice on the third day is to be burned up completely. If any of the meat of the sacrifice of his peace offerings is eaten on the third day, the sacrifice will neither be accepted nor credited to the person offering it. Rather, it will have become a disgusting thing. And whoever eats it will bear the consequences of his wrongdoing. Meat which touches something unclean is not to be eaten, but burned up completely. As for the meat, everyone who is clean may eat it. But a person in a state of uncleanness who eats any meat from the sacrifices of peace offerings made to Adonai will be cut off from his people. Anyone who touches something unclean, whether that uncleanness be from a person, from an unclean animal, or from some unclean, detestable thing, and then eats the meat from the sacrifice of peace offerings for Adonai, that person will be cut off from his people. Adonai said to Moses, Say to the people of Israel, You are not to eat the fat of bull, sheep, or goats. The fat of animals that die of themselves or are killed by wild animals may be used for any other purpose, but under no circumstances may you eat it. For whoever eats the fat of animals of the kind used in presenting an offering made by fire to Adonai will be cut off from his people. You are not to eat any kind of blood, whether from birds or animals in any of your homes. Whoever eats any blood will be cut off from his people. And Adonai said to Moses, Say to the people of Israel, A person who offers his sacrifice of peace offerings to Adonai is to bring part of the sacrifice of peace offerings as his offering for Adonai. He is to bring it with his own hands, the offerings made for Adonai by fire. He is to bring the breast with its fat. The breast is to be waved as a wave offering before Adonai. The Kohen is to make the fat go up and smoke on the altar, but the breast will belong to Aaron and his descendants. You are to give the right thigh from your sacrifices of peace offerings to the priest as a contribution. The descendant of Aaron who offers the blood of the peace offerings is to have the right thigh as his share. For the breast that has been waved and the thigh that has been contributed, I have taken from the people of Israel out of their sacrifices of peace offerings and given them to Aaron the Kohen and to his descendants as their share forever from the people of Israel. On the day when Aaron and his sons were presented to serve Adonai in the office of Kohen, 
This portion was set aside for him and his descendants from the offerings for Adonai made by fire. On the day they were anointed, Adonai ordered that this be given to them by the people of Israel. It is their share forever through all their generations. This is the law for the burnt offering, the grain offering, the sin offering, the guilt offering, the consecration offering, and the sacrifice of peace offerings, which Adonai ordered Moses on Mount Sinai on the day he ordered the people of Israel to present their offerings to Adonai in the Sinai desert. That's a mouthful, isn't it? And I recall chapter 7 is just a continuation of chapter 6. The entire context remains the same. And now armed with that, let's continue with the priestly instructions for the next type of sacrifice, the asham, or the reparation offering, which is what I prefer to call it. This is usually translated as a guilt offering. Now in verse 7 of chapter 7, what we find is that the previous provisions for the Asham are identical to those of the Hata'at. How do I know this? Because it explicitly says so. And we see that this is a Kodesh Kodeshim class of offering, most holy. Because in verse 1 it says it's most holy, which is the translation of Hebrew Kodesh Kodeshim. Now we're not going to spend a lot of time here because this is identical to the Hata'at. But just know that this is yet another blood, sacri blood sacrifice, that is an animal slaughtered. It has to occur at the same place as the Ola, which is on the north side of the brazen altar. And as with the Ola, it is the internal organ fat that is burned up on the altar. If it's not a sheep, then its fat tail is to be, or rather, if it's a sheep, its fat tail is to be included in that. And the portions of meat that are left over, the ones that aren't put on the, to the brazen altar, those are given to the priests as their food. And they are required to eat this food within the grounds of the tabernacle. They can't take it home. Now verse 8 makes it clear that the valuable hide of the animal is not to be burned up on the altar. It's to be given to the priests. It becomes the sole property of the priests. What would they do with this hide? Sell it, barter it. The idea is that the priests of God are to be fully cared for by the whole congregation. And let me remind you that a modern day pastor is not the equivalent of a priest. That is not to say that modern day pastors shouldn't be supported to some level. And that is most certainly addressed and called for in the New Testament. But the New Testament comparison is to a teacher of the word, not to a priest. The better comparison is between a pastor and a rabbi. We're also told that regardless of whether the Asham or the Hata'at is the offering of a worshiper or of a priest, that the priest gets to keep the high. That's as opposed to a rule the priest cannot keep food meat that he himself or another priest offers. There are a couple of exceptions to this rule. Generally it's when a sacrifice is to be burned up not on the brazen altar at the tabernacle but on a common wood fire outside the camp. And when we get to the red heifer sacrifice we're going to get into more details about that, and I'm telling you the red heifer sacrifice is fascinating. Truly fascinating. Now verses 9 and 10 offer us another little peculiarity. If a minka offering is of dough that's been cooked, the priest who bought it, brought it gets to keep his portion. But every other kind of minka, presumably meaning uncooked dough or flour, is to be shared among the priests. No reason for this is offered. It's just a rule. But one thing's for sure, common folks, lay people, can't share in it. Verse 11 now leaves behind the um, Asham offering and addresses the Zeva offering, what 
we're going to call the peace offering. Now, now let me say that pretty much any concise name in English that we could choose for this offering, and, and, and most others that we could actually, none of them encompass all the nuances that, about this offering. So calling the Zeva a peace offering is just partially accurate. Okay. But perhaps the key thing to understand about these sections of chapter 6 and 7 that we're, we're about to enter, beginning with verse 11 of chapter 7, is that these are an entirely different class of offerings. The offerings discussed in chapter 6 and 7 up to now have been what they call the Kodesh Kodeshim class, the most holy class. We now come to the Kadesh Kalim class, or the offerings of lesser sanctity. Now let me be clear. The Kodesh Kodeshim are not offerings of no sanctity, just not as much as the other ones. So just as the tabernacle's front room is called the holy place, and the back room is called the holy of holies, so we have most holy offerings, and now we have simply holy offerings. And with the Kodesh Kalim offerings, it was permissible for both the worshiper and the priest to eat of it. The worshiper outside of the tabernacle area, the priest inside of the tabernacle area. Now, I don't want to make your head spin, if they're not already, but you need to know there were several types of Zeva offerings. And we're going to look, look at the two primary ones. The Zeva Shlamim and the Zeva Toda. And if you wandered around modern day Israel, you'd hear the word Toda spoken a lot. Because it's the Hebrew word for thank you. But it's also the Hebrew word for thanksgiving. So the idea behind the Zeva Toda was that there was an, this was an expression, uh, rather it was an occasion to uh, express gratitude, thank you, to Yehovah. And this gratitude was usually regarding being delivered from some kind of a dangerous situation or maybe surviving in battle or, or surviving a serious illness. In common language, the Zeva Toda incorporated both an animal sacrifice and a grain portion. And technically, the Zeva Toda was only the animal portion, which was always accompanied with another offering, a grain offering. Just to confuse us a little bit more, depending on the exact kind and purpose of the Zeva, the dough of the grain offering was either leavened or it was unleavened. We're going to just leave it there. The second primary kind of zeva was called the zeva shlamim. And it could be called the vow offering because it had to do with both the original pronouncement of a, of a personal vow that a worshiper might undertake and also used when that vow was completed. So upon make the making of a sacred vow to God, a zeva shalamim offering was performed, sacrificial offering, and when that vow was completed, it was performed again. In the New Testament book of Acts, we read of Paul being instructed by James to pay for what? The vow offerings of some men who had completed their vows. This was in order to prove, by the way, to everybody present that Paul remained a completely Torah observant Jew even with his belief that Yeshua was the Messiah and what Paul was specifically paying for was the sacrificial animals required for the Zeva Shlamim offering that these men were required to perform at the end of a vow. Now in verse 17 we begin to receive what are some general rules about sacrificial procedures? Even though 
for the moment they are in the context of the zeva sacrifices. And it is that there's a certain amount of time that people have to eat the meat from sacrifice animals, whether the partaker was a priest or a non-priest. And the general rule was you had two days to eat it. The start of the third day, whatever remained had to be destroyed by fire. It wasn't a sacrifice. It just burned up to get rid of it. In fact, the instructions are pretty onerous. Should somebody eat that meat on the third day after a sacrifice, the eating of the meat negates the sacrifice you made in the first place. So you probably don't want to do that. Except that it would be better if that person had never sacrificed at all. Because breaking the law about eating it before the third day, now the person's committed another sin. Now, since the shlamim could be handled by laymen, just common worshipers, and the meat could be eaten by the worshipers outside of the tabernacle area, we get a further admonition that flesh that touches anything unclean should not be eaten. This because the flesh, the food, has become unclean by contact. And this puts an exclamation point on the rather critical God principle that uncleanness can be transferred by contact. In this case, the meat began ritually clean. But should it contact something or someone that's in an unclean state, then that meat becomes infected with this uncleanness. So the principle in a word in this is uncleanness is contagious. And further, as it says in verse 20, it's not just food that touches something unclean that becomes infected with uncleanness. Should a worshiper become ritually impure, ritually unclean? Same thing. For instance, by coming into contact with death or a creature that's considered unclean. Then not only does that person become unclean, but any food that person touches becomes unclean. Again, uncleanness, impurity that comes into contact with something that is holy or clean makes that holy or clean thing or person unclean. Remember our one-way street. Holiness is not permitted to be transmitted by accidental touch or contact, but uncleanness is. And next in instruction, is, and as a matter of fact, it is so much that that's why we see these, that's why they have all those mikvahs all over the place. Um, dealing with uncleanness was the bane of everyday life for a Hebrew. Next, an instruction is given that no Israelite can eat the fat of an ox, same thing as a, as a cow, a cattle, okay. nor of sheep, nor of goats. Now, sometime we back, uh, back, we examined the word for fat, and we found that there's two kinds, thus two Hebrew words for them, chelev and shuman. Shuman was ordinary fat. That kind of is found underneath the, the skin or the hide of an animal. Just like we see in the meat counters. All right, on a cut of meat. That kind. Halev is the fat that covered some of the internal organs. And it was this kind of fat that we used for sacrificial burning up on the altar. And it was this kind of fat, halev, that is specifically declared off limits in verse 23. Verse 23 is not talking about Schumann, ordinary meat fat. So the idea is that the halev type of fatty portions of the sacrifice can't be eaten by anyone ever, layman or priest. However, this was also, in a short time, extended to the prohibition of eating halev fat even if the animal had not been offered for sacrifice. In other words, you just got hungry, you slaughtered a sheep and ate it. You still can't eat that kind of fat. So, verse 26 now lays down the law. No blood may be eaten by Israelites. What this meant was that the blood drained from an animal couldn't be made into some kind of food. 
nor could the blood be used as an ingredient in cooking. It couldn't be drunk. And by the way, the drinking of animal blood is still relatively common in the world, right? particularly outside of the Western culture today. It is also meaning that meat had to be well drained of its blood and covering it in salt, which is a natural absorbent, helped to remove that residual blood within the various cuts of meat that both the priests and the layman would cook and eat. The New Testament admonition that waste salt was only fit to be trodden upon underfoot was referring to this salt that had been used to soak up that residual blood and then it had been discarded as you can imagine by the tons that it was used. Well they used that then to go out and salt pathways to keep vegetation from growing on it. That's what it's talking about. Now let me remind you that one of the, the, there was one pl primary reason that blood was never to be consumed by man. Because blood had been set aside as the one and only holy medium by which to attain atonement. And therefore, it could be used for no other purpose under heaven. Blood was, and it remains, the only means of atonement that God will accept because it's the one and only means of atonement he has ordained. There is no other. And upon the advent of our Lord Yeshua, Jesus the Christ, that sacrificial system that we are studying about in Leviticus transformed, whereby it still required the blood of atonement, but it was only his perfect blood that could atone. The blood of bulls and goats lost their efficacy to atone for sin, never to return. That is, God, uh, just as God specifically ordained certain animals' blood to be spilled for each type of atonement, upon Jesus' death and resurrection, God ordained that animal blood could no longer be used for atonement. And that, my friends, is why as much as on the one hand we long for the day the temple will be rebuilt in Jerusalem because we know upon its rebuilding it will literally for absolutely uh, certain be only a matter of months until Messiah returns. On the other hand, the rebuilding of the temple for the purpose of sacrificing to achieve forgiveness of sins must not be its purpose. Yet it is undeniable that we find in God's word that when the temple is rebuilt, sacrificing will begin again. And interestingly, we don't find the Bible condemning this action or speaking of it in a negative term. Therefore, there is a lot we don't know, a lot we don't understand about this coming rebuilt uh, temple, and especially of the revival of animal sacrificing. In fact, it's because of this issue of renewed animal sacrifices that many Bible scholars and many mainstream denominational doctrines teach there will be no such thing as an actual millennial temple. Their belief is that this extensive description of the temple in the book of Ezekiel, of Ezekiel is just page upon page of allegory because they can't reconcile Yeshua being the sacrifice once and for all with the God-ordained revival of temple sacrifice. So they wave their hand and spiritualize it all away. There can't be any possibility, they say, of there being a literal temple or literal sacrificial offerings by a literal Levitical priesthood. But that's why we study the Torah and especially Leviticus. Because as we are seeing, follow me, most of the sacrifices that we have studied about have nothing to do with atonement for sin. When Christian pastors and teachers and writers and lecturers and even renowned Christian Bible scholars talk 
about the sacrificial system, they erroneously think it's all about sin and atonement. When in fact, that's not the case at all. Rather, the bulk of the Levitical sacrifices were for things like reparations for doing wrong, offerings of thanksgiving, offerings to ask the Lord to come near to them, offerings of the harvest and of the first fruits, vow offerings, and so on. See, from my study of the New Testament, clearly Christ's death dealt only with the atonement of sin and to a lesser extent purifying uncleanness caused by sin. In fact, that's exactly what we're repeatedly told in the Gospels and in the various epistles. Should we think that his death on the cross ended sacrifices of worship, sacrifices of thanksgiving, of the harvest and of first fruits, that's all over with now? There's no evidence of that, scripturally. So I see no conflict between Yeshua's sacrifice for our sins versus renewed temple sacrifices, even in the millennial kingdom, when Yeshua will be present as king and high priest, especially if those sacrifices are about things other than atonement. You see what I'm talking about? Even more, the New Testament informs us that believers are this era's temple of God on earth. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3.16, Do you not know that you yourselves are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God therefore lives in you? See, this astounding reality is repeated and confirmed in a number of places in the New Testament. Yeshua insisted also he was greater than the temple. Listen to Matthew 12.6, But I say to you that in this place is one greater than the temple, referring to himself. And then in Mark 14, 58, Christ called himself the temple of God. We have heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and then I'm going to raise up another one not made with hands. When and how did mankind become temples of God? I know exactly when. Exactly on Shavuot, Pentecost, in Greek. What is it that makes anyone a temple of God? The indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That was the whole purpose for the temple. Without the Spirit living there, it's, it's a useless, fancy building. Without God living in you, you're a useless hunk of flesh. true. When God's Spirit isn't there, whether it's of a human or of a gorgeous temple, it's just a hollow structure. It serves no useful purpose more than a warehouse that's empty. But there is a heavy, heavy scriptural implication that His Spirit will return to the temple when it's rebuilt. Why exactly? I'm not certain. So at the same time that from some believers' viewpoint, a new temple's kind of redundant and unnecessary, I want to urge a caution. We should not be judgmental towards those religious Jews who yearn for the temple and those who are actively constructing temple ritual instruments, nor those who will in the near future officiate those temple procedures, including ritual sacrifices. A dear friend of mine and of ours in Torah class is Gershon Solomon, the founder and president of the Temple Mount Faithful. And as the name implies, it is that organization's goal to see the temple rebuilt right where it was destroyed almost 2,000 years ago. And as I hope you're beginning to see, the earliest disciples of, of Christ, including the apostles, including Christ himself, constantly gathered where? At the temple. Long after Yeshua's death 
we find Paul participating in temple worship and animal sacrifices. The early believers still went to the temple after Jesus' death, and they performed all the traditional temple ceremonies. Why? Because it was still there. Listen to Acts 22, or rather Acts 2, 44 to 46. And all they who believed, believers, were together. And whatever belonged to them was of the community. And they who had a possession sold it and divided it to each one as he had need. And they continued daily at the temple with one soul. And at home they broke bread and took food rejoicing and in the simplicity of their heart. See, some things about the Lord and his plan that at first seem so easy to understand, so black and white, turn out to be complex and a little harder to discern. As Christians, we can at the very least view the rebuilding of the temple and the reconstitution of its animal sacrifices as a sign of where the history of the world stands and as a fulfilled Bible promise. The temple will perhaps once again mark the place on earth that the Lord chose long ago as his earthly throne. It will be that visual confirmation, that, that monument to his grace and sovereignty that's been missing for two millennia. The sacrifices will, for at least a time, be a commemoration, in my view, of God's plan of salvation and a graphic demonstration of the work of Messiah. This isn't much of a stretch. Jews and Christians commemorate and honor many past events by reenacting portions of that event. For all we know, the reordination of the temple and the, the rekindling of that brazen altar fire followed by a parade of bulls and rams and sheep and goats up that altar will be the thing, the very thing that impacts God's chosen people in such a way that they finally get it. Yeshua of Nazareth really did fulfill all of these atoning sacrifices. Well, back to the matter at hand. The end of verse 26 includes the phrase, in any of your settlements. That is, the consumption of blood must not happen in any of your settlements. Now, why would the Bible add those words? Where else would Yehovah be talking except about an Israelite settlement? The idea being expressed here is that this law about not eating blood is to be obeyed even outside the tabernacle grounds, even outside the camp. Many of the ritual laws we have encountered only apply to the temple grounds. But this law, along with some others, applies in all circumstances wherever a Hebrew lives. In modern lingo, this says, you don't eat blood anytime, anywhere, for any reason. That's the rule. Now, while all of chapter 6 and the first part of chapter 7 of Leviticus were primarily aimed at the priesthood. Verse 29 is specifically directed at the people of Israel, lay worshipers. And it is concerning the Zevah Shlamim offering and the regulation that is commanded is that the worshiper must present the Zevah Shlamim sacrifice offering by himself by his own hands. What presenting means here is not laying the animal on the brazen altar. For that's always the task for the priest. That rather it is that the worshiper lifts the animal up himself, makes a waving motion with it before the Lord. In Hebrew, this is called tenufa, literally presentation. So we get this picture of a common man bringing his animal to the tabernacle, it's sacrificed, and whatever part's going to be burned up at the altar is lifted up and presented by the worshiper to Jehovah. Then it's turned over to the officiating priest who lays the fat portion onto the brazen altar and it's burned up. Some Christians call this presentation of the sacrifice a wave offering. And by the way, it doesn't mean that we stand and look up and wave hello to God. 
Okay, that's not what that means. And believe me, some actually do that and think that's what it means. Hi, God. No. Now, last week, we discussed that there were two primary classes of offerings, Kodesh Kodeshim, Most Holy, Kodesh Kalim, offerings of lesser sanctity. However, the offerings of lesser sanctity usually did have significant participation by the one who brought the sacrifice. Obviously, the Zevah Shlamim was a Kodesh Kalim class of offering since it was the worshiper who presented the offering directly to God. Verses 34 and 35 reinforce a couple of general rules we've already discussed. In verse 34, it says that Yehovah has taken the meat of the Zevah Shlamim offering and he's given it to the priests as their portion. That is, when something's brought in to be sacrificed, it immediately becomes Yehovah's property, God's holy property. It's his decision what he does with it. In this case, he's turned some of it over to the priests. Notice also in verse 35 at the end of the verse, it explains that what has just been instructed is to take place after Aaron and his sons have been consecrated to be priests, which has not happened yet. So Leviticus chapters 1 through 7 are speaking about that which is to happen, but it hasn't occurred yet. So as of the end of Leviticus chapter 7, just to give you a point in time, as of the end of this chapter, and we're going to start 8 next week, the tabernacle has not been built, the priesthood has not been ordained. God's just preparing Israel for what's going to come. Father God, we thank you for these words. Oh Lord, some of this is so hard. It really is. It's hard to drink all this in, Father. It just comes at us like a fire hose. And yet, Father, we see as we move along and we add this to our understanding. Oh Father, sin and atonement is so complex, so multifaceted. There's so much going on. It's not so simple. And a great price has to be paid for our sin, the greatest price, and you paid it, because we could never do it sufficiently, that it could be once and for all time. Never, Father, could we offer a sacrifice that paid for our intentional sins, for our high-handed sins against you. You never provided for that, Father. That cost the worshiper their lives their eternal lives, but Lord, for us, you have given us your Son, and his blood is so perfect that even our intentional sins, our direct sins against you, can be paid for. Father, we thank you for this, and I hope, Lord, that we all leave here recognizing what a wonderful thing you have done for us, and that the world needs to know. We bless your holy name here, Lord. Amen. Okay, see you next time. Thank you.